Amen. Where we went to this morning was Daniel 11 verse 40. And we wanted to treat it like a parable, which means it comes in two parts. It comes in an alpha and an, uh, it, comes in, it comes in two parts. Um, getting stuck on the alpha and omegas. Part A and part B. And as you're going to treat it like a parable, it means you have to compare and contrast them. When you keep things as a parable and you use that methodology, it saves you from a great deal of danger. It stops you making mistakes. So when we took part A and part B, we saw that first it took us to 1798, there's been a ongoing war between the king of the north and the king of the south. There's 1260 years of captivity of God's people. And 1798 is a deadly wound, but it isn't the death. The death is a period of time, but it becomes inevitable after this wound because it's a deadly wound. And we took, we went to, um, the Ellen White quote, where she says that he who went into captivity, who fulfilled this prophecy, was the Pope himself. And he held the, he held the temporal authority of the Catholic Church under him. He's led into captivity in 1798. He dies in 1799. And after this, they do not have Popes that have that same degree of authority that he'd held. We took that to part B, 1989. We saw there'd been an ongoing war between the King of the North and the King of the South and there'd been 126 years of captivity of God's people. 1989 for the King of the South also was not a death. The fall of the Berlin Wall did not end the Soviet Union. It just made its end inevitable because the events of 1989 were deadly for the King of the South. But the actual death took a period of time from 1989 to 91. And we'd already considered that concept when we talked about uh, what the seventh head looked like, that it's repeating this history as you see the King of the South fall from Panium to Sunday Law. And you can demonstrate that with multiple witnesses. So if the King of the North, after its death in this history, was go is going to resurrect, it's coming out of a bottomless pit. And who do you put in a pit? Oops. Just in general. Not, we don't have to be specific. Dead. Someone who's dead. So if, if, if you put me in a pit, what's the pit? Grave. It's a grave. So we see when it resurrects, it's coming out of the grave. And this also in itself, that whole story is another counterfeit of Christ's death and resurrection. When we come then to the King of the South, we see the same pattern. We then know that after 1991, it also had to come back into history before its final death. This is comparing and contrasting King of the North and King of the South, deadly wound and death. But if we're going to talk about apostasy and captivity, we can't compare King of the North and the King of the South because the King of the South cannot be an apostasy to a boss they don't have. They're rebellious to religion no matter what form it takes whether it's Satan's or God's. So that's why when we come to Daniel 2, the statue is the king of the north as opposed to the mountain, which is the true king of the north. There's no Egypt or king of the south in that history, in that parable. So to see cap apostasy and captivity, we can't do this, compare and contrast. We have to compare Israel and Babylon, true and counterfeit. Israel goes into apostasy. Because of that, they are led into captivity. When God brings the king of the north against them, the king of the north is not part of his kingdom, but he uses them. In 1773, persecution nearly wholly ceased because they abolished the Jesuit order. They chose temporal prosperity over their job function. That is the latest in condition. So the Catholic Church has gone into their own latest in condition against their boss. They go into apostasy, so their boss brings the king of the south to lead them into captivity. The king of the south is not part of his kingdom, but he uses them. It's forming the same repeating pattern. What brings Israel out of captivity is a three-step 
prophetic testing message. Fear God, give him glory because judgment is coming. And when do we see that three-step prophetic testing message laid out? 1798 it begins. It's properly laid out, formalised in 1818. So this message of the Millerites, of William Miller, was that for us or for them? But William Miller's message, who was that for? Was that meant to be in some type of time capsule and held till we were born? No. It's, it's specifically for them, for their history. So the history of Fatima and the three secrets, is that for modern Babylonian now history and Francis and the Catholic Church? Or was that specific for 1917? It must be specific for 1917. So what I want us to do is consider what modern Israel looks like. And we'll start with modern Israel. And then we're going to consider modern Babylon. First of all, we want to consider the true. Modern Israel. First of all, you have captivity, 538 to 1798. It's 1260 years. And then what begins to happen? What happens in 1798? Internally. The first angel. There's the raising up. What I want us to see is there's the raising up of a messenger. William Miller. And we can see right then the leadership of the Protestant churches the, those leaders are bypassed. It goes to who Ellen White calls an honest-hearted farmer. We'll just lay out the basic structure of that reform line. William Miller, 1798, he buys his Cruden's Concordance that he's going to later use in his Bible study. He devotes two years to the study of the Bible from 1816 to 1818. 1816 to 1818 and we call this the increase of knowledge you find all this in the great controversy that's great controversy uh, 329.2 he devoted two years to the study of the Bible when in 1818 he reached the solemn conviction that in about 25 years Christ would appear for the redemption of his people so he has all his whole message in capsule form in 1818. But we need to mark 1816 as well. He isn't yet ready to share. When does he begin to preach? 31, he begins to preach. 33, what does he get? He gets his credentials. He gets that signed document that he needs to have the authority to share that message. And this all, this message, he begins to be officially shared, 31 to 33. And it all leads down to 1844. And what is 1844? Disappointment. A bitter experience. So this is that history. First of all, they have an increase of knowledge. He has his message, he begins to share it, but his message ends in disappointment. In this history of 1844, who shares the message of October 22? It's not William Miller. 
Samuel Snow. So the first thing we need to recognise that in the history of 1844, you can mark William Miller and Samuel Snow. Are they in agreement? Yes. When? I want to say they're not in agreement and they never come into agreement. William Miller never accepted an exact day. Not even when he accepted the message of Samuel Snow was he willing to put his feet in the water and say it's really October 22. He kept it vague. So you have the traditional leadership of the church, William Miller, as opposed to a newcomer, a nobody. And who's right and who's wrong? What is Snow saying? About October 22. October 22. What is Snow saying October 22 is? No. He's saying it's the second advent. So is Samuel Snow correct? No. He's half right and he's half wrong. He has the day right and the event wrong. It ends in October 22, 1844 as disappointment and failure. So if we were to mark this as a scattering time, then we have 46 years of a gathering time. It's a 46 year history and they're being gathered. What happens after 1844? They're again scattered. They're scattered from 1844 to 1850. And what happens in 1850? There's a chart. I want to give us a quote. It's Review and Herald, November 1, 1850. It's Review and Herald, November 1. 1850. Paragraph 9. Ellen White says that she's been shown something by the Lord. She's been shown it previously on September 23rd, but she is writing this, documenting it, and sending out on November 1. The Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people. When was the first time he was recovering the remnant? In this history. So he's made a first attempt to recover his people. That's ended in failure. He's making a second attempt. It's November 1, 1850. This marked the beginning of another gathering time. They put out another chart and they were meant to take that message to the world. In the scattering time, 1844 to 1850, Israel was smitten and torn. But now in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up his people. In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished but little or nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw it was a shame for any to refer to the scattering for examples to govern us now in the gathering. So she's saying that there was a first attempt and then there was a scattering when they were smitten and torn and now God is making a second attempt to gather his people. You can mark this in November 1. 1850. There's a couple of other quotes. We won't read them for time and also because I'm in the wrong set of notes. But she also says in November 1, it's in the, on the same day, November 1, 1850, she says that God, it was God that orchestrated the designing of the 1843 chart. And she says on the same day, November 1, 1850, that they are to construct another chart. You can link all of this on November 1. 
that becomes important. And how did that go for them in 1850? Was that successful? How? The chart went out, but what's the problem with the people? This is when they're going into the later scene condition. And instead of the work taking off like it should have, it just brought them to 1863. And what's happening in 1863? Two things happen within, you can see it, it, its connection with external events, but one is organisation. Is organisation bad? No, I want to say that's a good thing. This movement needs to be organised. Everything needs to be organised. This organisation work was a good thing, but what's bad about 1863? What do they do to their prophetic message? They reject their prophetic message. So we find that in 1863, and still, instead of completing this work, they go into another time of scattering. This is the 1260. And we take it down to 1989, and this is a 126. This is a time of scattering. This is a time of scattering. What happens between 1863 and 1989? There's a second attempt to finish the work. 1888 history. So in 1888, there's a message brought and there's another attempt to sort out the problems of the church. What's the problem with 1888? Trajection. Why? The internal dynamics of the church. You have Butler. And Wagner. Who's the leadership? Butler. He's the leadership. Who's the leadership? Miller. So Butler is opposing the work of a newcomer. He doesn't support it. And who's right and who's wrong? Fifty-fifty. They're both right and they're both wrong. I'll read from 9MR 218.1. It's 9MR 218.1. 9MR 218.1. She's in vision. She has an angelic, a, an angel guiding her through this vision. She, sa she sees this angel with an arm stretched towards Wagner and another arm stretched towards Elder Butler. And what does the angel tell her? Neither have all the light on the law, neither position is perfect. So what's the problem? They're half right and they're half wrong. In 1886, Butler attacks Wagner's position with a document. He writes a pamphlet on the book of Galatians, the law in the book of Galatians. So in 1886, you have a pamphlet written by Butler <coughs> and it's attack on Wagner's position. How did this history end? Yeah. Failure. So we come to 1989. If this is the Alpha history of modern Israel, a 1260 takes us to the Alpha, a 126 takes us to the Omega, and who's raised up? Elder Jeff. This is Alpha. And this is Omega. Sorry. So this is modern Israel. It's in two parts. It's in a 46 year history of the Millerites from 1798 to 1844. They've come out of a scattering time or a time of captivity. And then in 1850, there's an attempt. It fails. You can tie it 
much of what makes this date significant to November 1. 1863, they organise, but they reject the prophetic message. 1888, there's another attempt in the middle of this scattering time, and it's Butler and Wagner, and they're half right and they're half wrong. In 1886, Elder Butler writes a pamphlet that attacks Wagner's position on the book of Galatians. 1989 marks the beginning of the Omega history. It's Daniel 11:40, part B. And it starts in 1989 with the bypassing of the Adventist leadership and the beginning <coughs> of an increase of knowledge into the book of Daniel begun by Elder Jeff, laid out in the Time of the End magazine. So 1886 to 1816 to 18, you can see 1991, 1833, his credentials, it's formalised, 1996, it's formalised as the Time of the End magazine. So I want us to take this history of modern Israel and because of, uh, what time is it? One time do we finish? I ask that every, every time. Okay. I want us to consider modern Babylon and what did we agree about modern Babylon? How many parts? Two. Part A and Part B, an Alpha and an Omega. When did they go into captivity? 1798, they go into captivity. You know when they come out, it's going to be in an Alpha history. It's going to repeat this history, not the one that we're in now. So we talked about Fatima. It's the three-step prophetic testing message. That's when it's documented and laid out. Who's raised up in this time? William Miller. Is he having open vision? No. You can mark the work of Ellen White. She's having visions. But that's not the experience of William Miller. I want to make one thing clear from the beginning. When you have a counterfeit, is it exactly like the true? No, otherwise it wouldn't be a counterfeit. Otherwise it would be of the same value, but it's not of the same value. So when we see the work of Lucia, is she having open vision? She is. She's having the, the apparitions that we see described. Who is she counterfeiting? William Miller or Ellen White? Oh. Ellen White. So when we look for someone raised up here, it can't be Lucia and Fatima. Can we see that? We're looking for someone else who bypasses the leadership. Lucia never bypassed the leadership. There has to be someone else in their history. So in this history of a scattering time, there's an influential family. It begins in the 18... Around the 1850s, there's a, uh, a man, his, his last name's Pacelli. I can't remember his first name, but it's particularly his family that are dedicated Catholic lawyers. They become extremely influential and they speak of the Catholic Church in this history as if they are in captivity. They see the Catholic Church is in captivity. They've lost um, their papal states. They've lost all of their political authority. And they live, this influential family who could have had a great deal of wealth, they live in comparative poverty to illustrate the condition of, of their church. They're in mourning, you could say, because they believe, as good Catholics, that they are in captivity. That's around the 1850s. They continue it. His son is, is of the same mindset. And then he has two grandsons. Around this time, there's around the... Around the beginning of the 1900s, there's a powerful cardinal. His name is Cardinal Gaspari. He wants to turn around the position of the Catholic Church and he begins to work with two grandsons of that original Pacelli. One of them is known as Francesco Pacelli.
and one of them is known as Eugenio Pacelli. And what they believe is that if the Catholic Church is going to come back into power, it must be done through the rewriting, entire restructuring of the Catholic Church and the introduction of a new church code of canon law. So Cardinal Gaspari begins to work with these two brothers of the Pacelli family. Francesco Pacelli works with Gaspari and what do they create? These ones write the Lateran Treaty. It's Francesco Pacelli that authors the Lateran Treaty and then organises its negotiation with Mussolini. That comes down through this line. This is how they get the Lateran Treaty through. He works with Mussolini in Italy. Eugenio Pacelli, he works with Cardinal Gaspari on a separate document. That's Code of Canon Law. And Eugenio Pacelli introduces Code of Canon Law into what country? It's Germany. It's his job to take Germany. It's his job to take Italy. Eugenio Pacelli re completely rewrites the Code of Canon Law for the Catholic Church in union with Cardinal Gaspari and then negotiates it with Hitler and we're going to go through that history. What I want to suggest is Eugenio Pacelli, after he's successful here, who does he become? Pius XII. The very first Pope in the Catholic Church who accepts Fatima. Before that, they were all in rebellion. They did not accept the messages of Fatima. And I'm suggesting this is 1899. Eugenio Pacelli is made a priest and he begins to have an increase of knowledge. Once he's made a priest, he, de he dedicates his time to a study of canon law. He meets with Cardinal Gaspari and they begin, its, begin rewriting it. When do they finish rewriting it? When is the new code of canon law completed? It's completed May of 1917. So they've rewritten the code of canon law. On May of 1917, it's the, the work is complete, it's finished. What happens in May of 1917? This is the first vision of Fatima in the same month. So you have two messages. One is the vision of Fatima, but there's also this restructuring of the Catholic Church. When Eugenio Pacelli finishes writing the Code of Canon Law, he meets in there, it's in I think one of the basilicas in Rome. The Pope comes to the basilica, he places his hands on Eugenio Pacelli and he makes him an archbishop. He makes him with an archbishop for the specific purpose of sending him to Germany to restructure the Catholic Church's relationship with the German government and with their own church in Germany. What day does Eugenio Pacelli become an archbishop with that task in mind? May 13, 1917. What day is the first vision of Fatima? May 13, 1917, Eugenio Pacelli forever after saw him himself connected to Fatima. He couldn't separate the two. He knew that they were intimately connected. And that's one of the reasons he becomes the first Pope in their history who accepts those visions. So May 13, 1917, he's made an Archbishop. Just a few days later, he's on a train to Germany to begin negotiating with the German government. How much success does he have? Not much. Why? The German government, World War II is ending, they have all kinds of internal problems. He needs a leader that he can work with. He finds that leader in Adolf Hitler. When Adolf Hitler is coming to power, there's one, one democratic party left that's standing in Hitler's way to absolute control of the German government. That is the Catholic Centre Party. They're the last democratic party that's restraining the Nazi party in their, in their government. So Adolf Hitler says to Eugenio Pacelli, I'll sign your code of canon law if you abolish the Catholic Centre Party and give me total control of the government. And Eugenio Pacelli does that in 1933. This is what marks Hitler taking control of the German government. This is Code of Canon Law. Not 
1945, how does this end? Disappointment and failure. What was Eugenio Pacelli's problem? What mistake did they make? Were they trying to do the right thing? What he's trying to do, he's taken the message of Fatima, he's accepted it, he's the first pope in this history, he fulfills the second, or thinks he's fulfilling the second secret, he didn't do it correctly, to dedicate, to dedicate Russia. He fulfills the second secret, accepts Fatima, he has the right message, he's united with Hitler to try and defeat the Soviet Union, so he's actively doing that, but the mistake he's made is he's chosen the wrong beast. He's chosen Hitler and Hitler won't be worked with. They were trying to work with the United States in this history, but it was happening too slowly and they became impatient. I would recommend the book Hitler's Pope. This was written by a Catholic who went into the Vatican archives and documented this history from their own archives. They chose the wrong beast, it ended in disappointment and failure, but he had followed the instructions of Fatima. He was trying to do the right work. How long is that history? 46 years. I'm going to paraphrase a couple of quotes from Hitler's Pope. They say that Eugenio Pacelli's remarkable agenda was impelled by an almost messianic conviction through three generations from his grandfather to, to him that the church could survive and remain united in the modern world only by strengthening papal authority through the application of law. And this rewriting of canon law made changes in the Catholic Church that exist today. They before that did not have the Catholic Church in every country so under the control of the Pope. This brought all of the independent kind of factions of the Catholic Church in all the different countries that they were kind of following their own rules back into a pyramid structure where they answered only to the Pope. He had to fight, fight his own church to do that because they saw it as a dictatorship taking control. Even for them, it's first the church, then the world. 1933, they signed that treaty with Adolf Hitler, giving him control of the German government. Okay, these are a couple of the other quotes. I'm going to read November 1, 1850. This is the quote of Ellen White, 5MR 202.4. She says, God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart. I saw it was needed and that the truth made plain upon tables would affect much and would co cause souls to come to the knowledge of the truth. So when Ellen White writes the letter and says, God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart, it's November 1. Nineteen forty-five, Adolf Hitler fails. The Iron Curtain starts to come down. It sweeps aqu across Eastern Europe. There's, there's trouble within all of those countries as to what side they're going to go on and Italy itself is engulfed with this problem whether or not they embrace communism or the West. And they almost embrace communism. This is a very dark and difficult time for the Catholic Church and for Italy itself. So they've been through a 46 year gathering time and then they're scattered. They're scattered from 1945. The church is in a mess, Italy's in a mess. Eugenio Pacelli sees the need to bring the Catholic Church back to some, some type of um, unity. To do this, he takes 1950. It is a when we talk about that, uh, that Jewish cycle, the, what, do, what do we call that? They have their Jubilee cycle. The Catholic Church has a Jubilee cycle every 25 years. 1950 is a Jubilee year. And Pacelli uses this Jubilee year to try and restore the Catholic Church. And he's going to do that 
through the messages of Fatima and the message of Mary. We talk about papal infallibility. That's something that came in under the First Vatican Council. But it is not something that applies to everything they do. They can very rarely actually use that claim to papal infallibility. They have to sign a document and pretty much say, I as Pope am using papal infallibility to say that this is the voice of God. The only time that papal infallibility has ever been used is in 1950. And it's when Pope Pius XII is trying to use drastic measures to reignite the Catholic Church. And he's going to do that with the immaculate, um, the, the dogma of the Assumption. Before this, the dogma of the Assumption of Mary was not official church teaching. But in 1950, he uses papal infallibility to say that the formal de definition of the dogma of the Assumption is the position of the Catholic Church and it's irrefutable by decree. He makes that he, he, he comes to that uh, conclusion. He makes it infallible by decree. He's trying to bring Mary back into the discussion. And remember, from Fatima forward, this is all about Mary. It was seen in this history as Mary against communism. He comes out on the Logia above St. Peter's Square and announces it to the thunderous applause of a million strong crowd. What day was that? November 1, 1950. And this is the, the dogma of the Assumption. Over in Spain, you have General Franco. And General Franco is, is, is he's in close union with the Catholic Church because he's fascist. You had Mussolini, Hitler and Franco. They're all fascists. They all ho hated the Soviet Union and they were all allied to the Catholic Church and general and even for years afterwards for the for the rest of Pope Pius XII's life when he would come out over St. Peter's Square and all the pilgrims would come to him they would shout Spain for the Pope and he would shout back and the Pope is for Spain because of his connection to Franco and Franco did not hide the fact that in his mind it was Mary Fatima and the dogma of the Assumption that was their strongest weapon against Catholicism. Franco used it, the Pope used it. But in 1958 he died and all of this attempt fell through. A new Pope came in and what's the problem with the new Pope? He wants to organise a second Vatican Council. You could call that reorganisation. The Second Vatican Council was to reorganise, restructure the Catholic Church. This Pope has a problem. He doesn't believe in Fatima, like Pope Pius XII does. They don't particularly like it, and one of the reasons they don't like it is that as the leadership, they do not have control over it. It's the same problem that our leadership was facing. They did not have control of the work of Ellen White. They could not control her or her writings. And these popes, they cannot control the message of Fatima. That's why they start trying to at least silence it. So this pope, he's organised the Second Vatican Council and what he wants is representatives from all different denominations to be witnesses at that council and to have their perspective heard. And who does he want at the Second Vatican Council particularly? He wants the Russian Orthodox Church and that's a problem because the Russian Orthodox Church doesn't do anything without the approval of the Soviet Union. So what did he have to do in 1962? Ambassadors from the, of the Pope and ambassadors of the Soviet Union, they met in a little town in secret It's the French city of Metz, August of 1962, two months before the Second Vatican Council opened. It was a secret meeting of the greatest importance and what they negotiated was a compromise. If, if the Soviet Union was to allow the Russian Orthodox Church to send representatives to the Second Vatican Council, the Pope had to promise that at this council there would be no 
loud condemnation of the Soviet Union or communism. They were planning to issue the, the, most, the strongest condemnation of communism the Catholic Church had ever given at the Second Vatican Council, and they didn't. They compromised. And that compromise is a rejection of the message of Fatima. It's a rejection of their prophetic message. That, I that condemnation of communism, it's in written in Latin and it's still, it's still in their archives, never translated, because they were never allowed to read it. So in this history, you have popes that are dismissive of Lucia. In 19, 1960, Lucia had written to the pope and she said, prior to 1960, 1960 is the year that the Third Vatican, the th that the Third Secret of Fatima is to ma be made public. She says, Mary told me you are to make the Third Secret of Fatima public in 1960. He read the Third Secret and then he had it locked away and he never released it. He's in open rebellion to, to the instructions of Lucia. Then you have Pope Pius the, um, Pope Pius the Sixth. John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, we're going through successive popes. From here on in, they're mostly rejecting the message of Fatima. I don't want to prove it or go into, I don't want to go into the proofs. I'm going to say that this is 2001. But what I want us to see is that between 1962 and 2001, we have to have a, a counterfeit 1888, when the work is attempting to be completed. And I want to suggest that's 1989. Again, you have a Pope who accepts the message of Lucia and of Fatima. And why does he accept it? Because he was assassinated. He, he, he was, he was shot, and what day was that? May 13. It's May 13 when he's shot. He almost dies, and when he comes to, after the operation, the first thing he asks for is the third secret of Fatima. He opens it. He'd never read it. He read about the judgment that was coming on the Catholic Church, and he applied that judgment to a, to a failure to dedicate Russia. So he starts this, this much stronger attempt to unify with with Reagan and, and take down the Soviet Union. He dedicates Russia, he, he, he makes a mistake the first time Lucia goes to him and she says, you did it wrong, it failed, he tries again uh, in I think 1984. I think he might try three times, but I can't quite recall. You You're supposed to bring all the cardinals together. No. It's, they're actually meant to all come together. And you have to specifically name. He, he, there, there was a list of instructions that he wouldn't follow. And neither did Pope Pius XII, that none of them are really following the instructions. So 1989, you have John Paul II. He accepts the message of Fatima. He tries to take down the Soviet Union. He takes down the Soviet Union. But what is he really wanting to do? It's the same thing Pope Pius XII wanted to do. What's meant to happen is it's not just that the East is free from the Soviet Union, it's to be dedicated to Mary. It's supposed to be a special area with a special, a, a special job function within the Catholic Church, dedicated to Mary, strongly under the authority of their uh, Catholic Church leadership. So in 1989, this begins to happen, it begins to fall. But what happens in Eastern Europe? They turn to capitalism. So they reject communism and they turn to capitalism. And did what did Pope Pius XII say about capitalism? He said quite a few things. But he said it's almost as bad as communism. He did not accept that any more than the other. And he begins, I would encourage you to read the book, His Holiness. It goes through his later years. And the title of those, that portion of the book is The Angry Pope. He was not a nice man once you crossed him. And he was so angry. If you looked at the people who came out in the, prior to the fall of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe to hear him speak, it's millions. By the time they've fallen and he has 
become so angry and his speeches were just vile. He would just tear them apart for turning to capitalism, for turning to all of the indulgences of the West, for embracing everything about the West, so the structure of their families, homosexuality, birth control. He's a very strong, traditional, conservative Pope, and he lost control of the East. It isn't just that he rejected the Soviet Union, he also, it also rejected him, and he took that rejection personally. And then he has another problem. He's meant to be working with the United States. After the Berlin Wall falls, what does the United States start doing? They want to invade Iraq, and what does he tell them to do? Don't do it. Are they listening to him anymore? No. no. Reagan, Bush by that stage, just stops listening to him. Senior and junior, neither of them are, have any use for him after the Soviet Union falls. And then he has a third problem. What's his third problem? His own people. So you have John Paul II in this history, and who is he fighting? The Jesuits. There's a, a complete split within the Catholic Church, open war between John Paul II and the Jesuits, because what's the mentality of the Jesuits? They're quite liberal. Liberal on issues like the woman's role in the church and birth control and all of these different things. They have quite a liberal perspective. But John Paul II only has this really conservative position. He also does not have total control over the Jesuits. So you have this split between John Paul II and the Jesuits. He has a close ally, Malachi Martin. Have you all heard of Malachi Martin? So in 1987, Malachi Martin wrote, writes a book. What's the book called? He, he writes a few. The one I want us to notice, it's given a long name, but it's called The Jesuit Order and the Betrayal of the Roman Catholic Church. It's just a detailed list of reasons why the Jesuits have betrayed the Catholic Church. A direct attack. So you have this internal problem here where you have the established leadership and who's right and who's wrong? Who's trying to take down the Soviet Union? John Paul II. I would suggest that the Jesuits, though, had the message. They've taken the reorganising of the Second Vatican Council and what the Catholic Church needs to be to work in the modern world. They know what it needs to be. And it needs to rethink these conservative, traditional from a new perspective from the perspective of the Second Vatican Council. But John Paul II won't budge from his conservative traditional position. And this all ends in failure. From 2001, oh, by the way, in this history, 1996, there's a, there's a, there's a group that forms within the Catholic Church. They meet in secret and they're in open rebellion to John Paul II. It's a collection of powerful cardinals and they're known as the as the St. Galen group. They jokingly referred to them as the St. Galen Mafia. They would meet in secret in the town of St. Galen. Pope Pius, uh, John Paul II tried to investigate them and he never was able to adequately prove who exactly the cardinals were because they're, they're meeting with the direct purpose of seeing how they can remove him or, or at least make sure that the next Pope is not like him. They want someone like this. They want a Jesuit. So they're meeting from 1996 to 2001, seeing how they can undermine his position. You start to see the whole Catholic Church in, in civil war. In 2001, there's a, um, a man made a cardinal from Argentina. His name is Bergoglio. 2001, he's made a cardinal. The St. Galen group meet him and they know that they have their man. They have the man they want to replace John Paul II. 2005, John Paul II dies. Same year, Lucia dies. They try to get Bergoglio in, but they don't. They get Benedict, someone that John Paul II had particularly trained up 
to replace him because he's of the exact same mindset. It takes them time to overturn the leadership of the Catholic Church. But 2013, Pope Benedict stepped, steps aside and who comes in? Everyone still alive from 1996 comes together. They have their second chance. This time they're successful and Bergoglio becomes Pope Francis. And now you have open civil war in the Catholic Church. This is what's going on right now. The, you'll meet Catholics who will say that Pope Francis is the Antichrist because they are, they are, they are Catholics who support John Paul II and Benedict. And this is the whole split between traditional and conservative. But Pope Francis is exactly who, who they need. He's going to see the fall of the King of the South, but he's the first Jesuit Pope in history. Amen. So I hope we can start to see a repeating pattern. You have a history of scattering. 1798, an honest hearted farmer is raised up who's going to replace the leadership. 1899, Eugenio Pacelli begins training. Increase of knowledge. 1816 to 1818, it's all laid out. The visions of Fatima, they begin in 1916. It's not as much spoken about, but this is when the children start having experiences with an angel. 1916 to 1917, May 13. You can tie May 13 to both Eugenio Pacelli and Lucia. 1816 to 18. It's formalised 1833 with William Miller's credentials, formalised 1933 with Code of Canon Law signed by Hitler and Eugenio Pacelli. William Miller then over becomes, uh, the, the leadership of the Protestant churches are officially bypassed and we can see William Miller. Eugenio Pacelli, the leadership of the Catholic Church is bypassed he becomes Pope Pius XII. It all ends in disappointment and failure in 1844, disappointment and failure in 1845, because in this work they, they had half of it right, but they had half of it wrong. November 1, 1850, they're trying to restart this work with a new chart and a gathering. November 1, 1950, it's the dogma of the assumption. It begins a gathering time but this doesn't go anywhere because the church isn't following and, and Pope Pius XII dies, they're in a Laodicean condition. 1863, there's organisation, but a rejection of the prophetic message with the 2520. 1962, there's organisation, but a rejection of the message of Fatima and the condemnation of the Soviet Union. 1866, we begin to see this tear, 1886, between... Butler and Wagner over, over the book of Galatians. It culminates in 1888 and they're half right and they're half wrong. 1987, Malachi Martin, close ally of John Paul II, writes about the Jesuits as traitors of the Catholic Church. This is the split between John Paul II and the Jesuits. This history was failure. They did not succeed in their work. 1989, we have to see a new leadership being raised up and this is Elder Jeff and we see 1991 increase of knowledge, 96 formalisation with the Time of the End magazine. 2001 we have an increase of knowledge and this is the work of Pope Francis. We don't have long left, I just want to make a couple of conclusions, important conclusions. What did we agree to when we talked about the battles. The Alpha and the Omega. And what, did, what conclusion did we come to? The Alpha history was failure. The Alpha is failure and the Omega is success. So we can see that Millerite history is failure. And we can see our history is success. But there's another point that we need to make. There's a history in the middle around 1888 and is that success or failure? If we were to talk about ancient Israel, we would call this Moses and Christ. What's the problem in the history of Moses? 
They're in captivity to Egypt. In the history of Christ, what's the problem? They're in captivity to Rome. Is there a captivity in the middle? Babylon. So they come out of Egypt and do they do the work they're meant to do? No, it was failure. They come out of Babylon. Do they do the work they're meant to do? No, they just turn into Pharisees. So when we come to the history of Christ, do they do the work they're meant to do? Yes, Ellen White's clear that this is total and complete success. It doesn't look like what they expected to look like, but it's total and complete success. The understanding that I want us to come to, what I want us to see, is that just like in the battles, we can't take failure and failure and lay it over a history of success and make a direct application. And the reason that I'm saying that is that was done in early April this year in Arkansas at a camp meeting. Elder Jeff took the history of 1844 and the history of 1888 and said Miller and Snow were half right and half wrong, and Butler and Wagner were, and were half right and half wrong. Therefore, when we come to the history of 2012, Elder Jeff and Elder Paminder are half right and half wrong. And what's the problem with saying that? Success. Because this is failure and this is failure. And we can't take two histories of failure. What is 1945 in our line? This is Panium. 1945, the king of the north is defeated, failure. Panium, the king of the north, is successful. It's a victory. It's not failure. It's success. So we can't take two histories of failure and bring them into a history of success. The reasoning was the following. When we have 2012, you have Elder Jeff, and Elder Parminder. And they're predicting, or Elder Parminder is predicting 2014, and who's the leadership? So there's someone coming in with a radical new concept that goes against the traditional conservative position of the movement and of Adventism. And it's time setting. And it's predicting 2014. And Elder Parminder is predicting 2014 as a Sunday law. Was there a Sunday law at 2014? Yes. It depends how you read. 2014 was a Sunday law. In 2012, they're predicting Sunday law on what reform line? On the line of the 144,000. When did the light of fractals open up? Here or here? Average. So when we come to the history of 1844 and Miller and Snow, Snow is predicting October 22. What is he saying this is? He's saying that this history is the second advent. And you have Miller, the leadership, and Snow. When, did the when was the light given for them to know better? After? Whose fault is it if it's after? God's. God's. Because Ellen White said that God gave them everything they needed. She said, God did not fail them, they failed. If they failed, they had everything they needed to know better. They should have known it in this history. So if, if you come to me and you say, Tess, 2014 is your Sunday law, are you right or are you wrong? You're right. If you come to me and you say, October 22 is your second advent, are you right or are you wrong? Really? Was October 22 the second advent? No. Are you right or are you wrong? You're wrong. 
These are not equal because this is what failure looks like and this is success. To say that 2012 was a failure because it did not include light that had not yet opened up would be to say that 1996 is a failed message, half right, half wrong, polluted message because we didn't yet understand the King of the South was returning into history and 1996 is perfect. It's perfect for its time. All that needed was expanding upon, not correction. Those are the differences between failure and success because if we're going to see this as half right and half wrong, we need to see 1996 as half right and half wrong. Both of them are the formalisation of the message. Both of them don't have all of the light, but they have what is necessary for that time period. When you come to the Millerites, it's failure. 1888 is failure. The history of Moses was failure. The, the coming out of Babylon was failure. All of this failed to do the work that they were required to do. This was for the first advent. This was for the second advent. So we cannot take two histories of failure and bring them into a history of success and drop them down. The reason that I want to make this clear is the following. Is if, if we take the concept that in a history of success, the message is half right and half wrong, then we can't just take that for 2012, we have to take that for the Midnight Cry message. And we have to know firmly why we believe that this is the truth, that there are not inbuilt mistakes in this message. If we accept that, if we hear this study presented, that 1844 and 1888 are telling us of our history, and that therefore, the midnight cry message is going to be half right and half wrong. What's the problem? What history are we repeating? Failure. Failure. But I want us to take it a bit more personally than that. In this history of Christ, what are the disciples doing? They, they're using a very good methodology, methodology we would approve of because it's, it's almost perfect. They're taking what this deliverance from captivity looked like and what this deliverance from captivity looked like and they're saying that's what our deliverance is going to look like. We're going to have a Moses that's going to kill all of the Romans. We're going to walk out of Babylon and, and rebuild our nation. They're taking two histories to define what this looks like and so is John the Baptist. He taught them that. But when you come to the history of the cross, who are you following? not John the Baptist. I want to make a point. John the Baptist is the greatest prophet that ever lived. We're told that. But we have to be sure in the history of, that we're in who we're following and why. I believe that Elder Jeff and all of us that have considered this subject are now in unity. I don't think there is any remaining division. But if you watched Arkansas and you didn't pick it up yourself and you haven't heard of that, then you need to understand why we're not in a history of failure and why we're not repeating this dynamic of half right and half wrong. And we can demonstrate that with our reform lines. So I want to make it clear. John the Baptist, greatest prophet that ever lived. But he had some misconceptions about what it meant to be delivered and he taught the disciples that. So when they come to the history of the cross, what's the problem? Why do the disciples believe that? I want to read Great Controversy 594.1. Before his crucifixion, the Saviour explained to his disciples that he was to be put to death and to rise again from the tomb. Is the message perfect? Yes. yes. Is, has he given it to them completely? Yes. yes. Angels were present to impress his words on minds and hearts, but the disciples were looking for temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke. Why? Because they have two histories, and on the testimony of two, they think they know what it's supposed to look like. They could not tolerate the thought that it didn't look like what they were expecting. The words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds, and when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The death of Jesus has fully destroyed their hopes as if he had not forewarned them. 
So in the prophecies, the future is opened before us as plainly as it was opened to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation 2019 and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes, internal, in the disciples, have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Our danger is that Christ's history is a history of success and what did the disciples do? They failed it. You can fail a history of success individually if you don't listen to the message and use, first of all, listen to the message, second of all, know who you follow, third of all, use correct methodology. So we can see 1844 and 1888 history, histories of failure, 1945, 1989 histories of failure. And I want to finish with one final point. I'm going to, I'll make some space. Remember what we said before. We said that when we come to raffia in its primary application, this is the cross. And you're a faithful disciple. You're following Christ. You've identified there's two messengers. There always is. There's Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, John the Baptist, Christ. There's a new leadership. Can you be safe in that history if you're going to look at all the pool of information that you have and you're going to go to the Pharisees and the structure for information? So let's say that there's two streams of information. First of all, you have the message of Christ and then you have the message of the Pharisees. Is there anything you have to gain from this? No. Nothing. Let's bring that internal. You're a disciple, you're trying to know what to believe. Are there two messages internal? You have the message of Christ and you have the internal, Judas. Do you have anything to learn from him? No. no. Come back to 1996, Time of the End magazine. Is it safe to drink from both rivers? Is it safe to swim in them? Then why are we still saying that you can take from both streams of information? Why does that still get said? Is it because we like how it tastes? Don't let human sophistry fool you. Only one stream of information is ever safe. From 1996, the Ula and the Hidekel, you bring that back to the reform line of Christ. And this false stream of information is not John the Baptist. I think what Elder J Jeff did for us was allowed by God because it's made us go back to this study and make it much, much stronger. It has no reason to cause disunity. I think God has had his hand over these things. But Pharisees and Judas, these have nothing to teach us. It will only destroy us. They have an external stream that's dangerous. They have an internal stream that's dangerous. They only know what's truth from error if they know who they're following and what methodology is being used. And that methodology is parable teaching. If we were to see the reform line of Moses, when do they go to work? Moses takes them over the Red Sea. Who takes them over Jordan? Joshua. Joshua, a second leader. And what happens after they cross Jordan? There's a small group of people that are going to take down the walls of Jericho. What was to happen to that city? Man, woman and child killed. Never to be rebuilt. Burnt from the bottom up. What's the problem? Someone goes into that city and they find a goodly Babylonish garment. And what does he say about that garment? It's good. 
So we can know the message and we can do that work and we can say, it's not all bad. My conspiracy theory is good. This part of the false stream of information is good. I don't want to let go of my ideas about gun control or about capitalism. There's something in this stream of information that's good and I'm going to hold on to that. No matter what the message says, let's not be fooled by human sophistry. It will kill you and your family. Amen. We have to decide between the Ulai and the Hidakel, internally and externally. So if you line up the modern Israel and modern Babylon, we have the true and the counterfeit. Both have an alpha history, both have an omega history. The cross is our way mark of raphia. It will be complete and total success. The message has been given that is clear. The problem is, is they have preconceived ideas based on two histories of failure. And for some, it'll be as if the message was never given. They have to listen to it, but they also have to put aside their old conspiracy theories and their old ideas, their traditional beliefs about what the end of the world looked like and about how they were to function as a church. There's learning they have to do, but the disciples have just as much unlearning. And in that process, there is only one stream, internally and externally. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, for our thank you for our blessings. Thank you, Lord, that you leave us these gems just to be dusted off and given at the right time. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to guide your people. Thank you for our leaders, Lord, all of them, those that are tired, those that have worked tirelessly. Lord, the leadership here in Canada, the leadership all across the world, Lord, that have worked and exhausted themselves to feed us and to guide us. I pray, Lord, that you'll give them strength. I pray, Lord, that we'll understand the time that we're living in, why we believe what we do. May we learn to read consistently and with a proper application for these, these histories that are behind us, that we can use them appropriately, that we can learn what we need to learn, but also see the differences. May none of us find ourselves at a test unprepared. I pray that you'll bless our day uh, and the meetings that are coming. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.